Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, students of Tamasa and Chula and, and other universities, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a standing room only crowd. This is a very uh, packed event for us. Please take a seat, or if you want to stand in the back, you're welcome to. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to introduce uh, today our uh, guest speaker, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Dan Russell. Uh, I think that your friends call you Danny, but we'll still call you Mr. Russell. Assist, Mr. Assistant Secretary, uh, I've checked with my, my friends in Washington and they speak very highly of you. I've read your speeches at the various uh, think tanks and I think that you're very lucid and clear. Uh, and we look forward to, to hearing uh, your thoughts and your ideas, your views uh, of the U.S. engagement in the Asia-Pacific region. This is an event that has a larger number of students than we normally have. So we want to, in cooperation with the embassy, to kind of pitch this as a young youth, lots of uh, young men and women here from the universities and they are our, our future. Uh, this is also based on this new initiative that the U.S. has for the region, the young, uh, it's called YCLE, Young Southeast Asia Leaders Initiative. You can look it up on the website. It's not a silly uh, initiative, it's YCLE, uh, Young Southeast Asia Leaders Initiative. And I think that my students uh, have already been aware of it. Uh, you'll get some applications from around here, from Chula and Tamasat. Uh, so it's, it's good to have students here. Uh, if we don't ask them to come directly, sometimes they get intimidated. So this time we actually have roped them in, uh, but, they also, but they also have uh, wanted to come. I also have strongly encouraged them to ask questions afterwards. Uh, and this acts as a makeup class for us, by the way. We have a reading on U.S. foreign policy later in the course, uh, so you know, your words and your views uh, will be counted in class uh, and we grade it accordingly. I hope they're getting extra credit. Yeah, extra credit. And we also have the only camera in the room is a, a YouTube, ISIS YouTube camera for uh, retroactive viewing. So those who cannot be here, uh, including students who cannot be here because of conflicting classes, uh, they can view the, the YouTube. Uh, so, for introduction, very brief, everyone has your bio, uh, extensive uh, illustri illustrative uh, uh, bio, and you've been with the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Daniel Russell has been with the National Security Council, been Special Assistant to President Obama. Uh, the topic, uh, I think we ended up uh, with uh, something about Asia Pacific and the U.S. and Asia Pacific in 2015 and beyond. Now, uh, I know you'll say uh, some remarks, I think you have prepared some, but Around here, we're interested to know uh, some issues uh, about the U.S. foreign policy in the region, U.S. alliances around here, uh, the pivot rebalance, uh, as you know. And then uh, we are also concerned about competing uh, challenges in the global arena, in the Middle East, in uh, Eastern Europe, and so on, that uh, perhaps may have been uh, distracting uh, or taking some attention away. Uh, and as you know, we have uh, Thai U.S. Uh, bilateral treaty alliance to also bear in mind. Uh, a lot we can talk about, time is short. I want to get started right away. You can speak as long as you like, but I think that there'll be a lot of uh, questions and comments from the floor. Um, after you speak here at the podium, uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary, and then I'll ask you to sit on the sofa and then we'll fill the, the rest. Okay? Please uh, join me in welcoming <laughs> Assistant Secretary Dan Russell. Professor Tidinam, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, hello, Bangkok. Sawadee <laughs> It's really great for me to be back in Thailand, and it's really an honor for me to be uh, here at Chula. Great, great school, and wonderful reputation. Um, let me start with a public service announcement. Uh, the bureau I'm responsible for, uh, the Asia 
Pacific, East Asia Pacific Bureau, has now a Twitter account, in large part thanks to uh, former ambassador to Thailand, uh, Christy Kenny, who's come back and uh, joined our bureau. Uh, so I want you all, if you would, to follow us on uh, Twitter at US Asia Pacific. So I got that commercial out of the way. Um, I first visited Thailand uh, many years ago in the, in the early 90s uh, as a junior officer, stayed for uh, at least a week or so uh, at the home of a foreign service friend who was serving here. And like all Americans, like all visitors to uh, Thailand, I fell in love. Uh, the warmth and the hospitality of the Thai people made a huge impression on me. I experience it every time I come back. Uh, I also had the great honor uh, working at the uh, White House at the National Security Council to accompany President Obama when he came to Thailand in uh, 2012 in November. And the uh, extraordinary experience of uh, visiting Wat Po, uh, the uh, honor of being received by uh, His Majesty the King similarly made uh, a profound impression on uh, the President and uh, has stayed with him. Uh, so uh, I come uh, here uh, as a friend. I'm in the middle of a trip through Southeast Asia. Uh, I also have stopped already in the Philippines and in Malaysia. When I leave here, I'm on my way to Cambodia. Uh, now, I didn't bring the President of the United States with me this time. Uh, uh, but I am here for the same reason that President Obama uh, came to uh, Asia twice uh, in last year uh, and has come uh, on an annual basis prior to that. Uh, he, I came here for the same reason that so many students and business people are uh, flocking to the Asia Pacific and the reason that our merchant ships and our Navy ships frankly call on uh, ports here. It's because the United States is also a Pacific nation. We are a resident uh, Pacific power and our prosperity and our security is closely linked, inextricably linked with uh, that of Asia. Our communities are connected by trade and travel and family ties, and our fates are closely linked by the many global challenges uh, that face us from climate change to pandemic diseases to violent extremism. One thing I have learned is that no nation, however strong, can solve these problems alone. So first I'll talk about the regional system, the regional architecture that the United States and our allies and partners, including Thailand, uh, have worked and built to meet with them. And then I'll spend some time talking about US-Thai relations and what we see as the pathway forward. For many decades, 2015 is in fact the 70th anniversary of the end of the World War and the creation of the United Nations. The U.S. has worked with uh, Pacific uh, and Asian allies. Uh, we've worked with partners like the ASEAN members to advance security, prosperity, and democracy through the region. And together, we've built an architecture, uh, a system of regional rules and institutions that aim at strengthening the rule of law. And this architecture, this system has helped to keep the peace in the region and many, many nations have taken advantage of the space provided by this peace and stability to develop both politically and economically. We see this in the many vibrant democracies that have risen uh, in, in the decades in places as diverse and as different as Indonesia, the Philippines, Taiwan, 
South Korea, Japan. And looking closer to the neighborhood, uh, while significant change, challenges remain in Myanmar, we've seen a historic opening up of that country after decades of isolation. And next door in Cambodia, uh, the agreement between the government and the opposition party last year has now created some real opportunities for reform and for strengthening uh, democracy. And in all of these places, democratic progress and economic progress have gone hand in hand. And we've often seen the success in one country inspire progress uh, by a neighbor. The Obama administration has supported this region's progress in many, many ways, uh, such as increasing our direct engagement with ASEAN, uh, which we see as a pillar of the international order. He decided to join the Treaty of Amity and Commerce uh, Cooperation. He appointed our first now, our second resident U.S. ambassador to ASEAN. Uh, and he, year after year, has personally and actively participated in the East Asia Summit. The U.S. strongly supports building up that summit, the EAS, as the premier forum for allowing leaders to address regional, political, and security issues. That includes challenges like the disputes in the South China Sea. And we also strongly support the ASEAN economic community that is uh, set to launch at the end of this year as well. We support, have hosted, and actively participate in uh, APEC, which is the economic pillar of the Asia-Pacific region. And APEC has done a lot to further the recovery from the global financial crisis, to empower women economically, and to ensure that growth is inclusive, that its benefits are helping people out of poverty and helping to grow the middle class throughout the region. And in APEC this year in Manila, we intend to explore how we can help expand the practice of corporate social responsibility uh, to promote more inclusive economic growth. Now, the oldest, the most venerable pillar of the regional order are our alliances including our alliance between uh, the United States and the Kingdom of Thailand, uh, and between the United States and the Republic of the Philippines. That's true for Australia, it's true for Japan, and it's true for the Republic of Korea. This system of alliances and security partnerships is not a legacy of the 20th century, it is an investment in the 21st century. It is essential. And that's true for a number of reasons. Number one, our alliance system is the backbone of cooperation in the region and around the globe. And it stands for the rule of law when it's challenged. And that applies, for example, to problematic uh, actions to unilaterally change the status quo in the South China Sea. We work regularly with our allies to make sure that our forces can operate together in a crisis in a moment's notice. And America's enduring 182 year and counting uh, a close relationship with Thailand is no exception. In fact, Together we've addressed humanitarian crises. <coughs> Together we've responded to natural disasters. We've combated uh, piracy, advanced public health, protected refugees, collaborated on counterterrorism and law enforcement efforts to fight threats to international security. <coughs> this cooperation is important to both of us, the region and the world, and it will continue. But our relationship with Thailand is defined by more than just the number of years that we've been allies, or even more than our common interests or our aspirations. Our friendship, founded 
so long ago has been constantly refreshed over time by Prince Mahidon's time uh, in the U.S. studying at Harvard, uh, by the birth of His Majesty the King in Massachusetts, by His Majesty's significant contributions to American culture, uh, to these many, many uh, connections. Our broad, enduring friendship is refreshed year in and year out by the thousands of Thai students who come to study in the United States every year, and I hope you will soon be among them. Similarly, by the many Americans who come to Thailand to study here. So for over two centuries, Americans have lived in and contributed to Thailand in various ways, just as the Thai have done in America. We stood as partners in World War II, supporting democratic ideals during the conflict in Indochina. We fought the scourge of terrorism as partners for uh, decades and continue to do so today in facing uh, the new and virulent uh, threat of uh, radical jihadism. Uh, and we've been partners bringing stability and prosperity uh, to the people of Thailand and more broadly the region. For over half a century, the uh, Peace Corps and US aid workers have helped with teaching, helped with rural development. And our healthcare workers and scientists have collaborated on research to combat malaria and HIV AIDS. Our law enforcement officers tackle trafficking in persons, narcotics, trafficking in wildlife. And this will continue. We've also enjoyed a long and mutually beneficial economic and trading relationship. The United States is Thailand's third largest trading partner. American companies are major investors in Thailand, supporting hundreds of thousands of jobs here, bringing leading technologies, bringing high standards. And I think that the experience of these US companies shows that it's not just the quantity of trade and investment that's important, although the quantity matters. It's also the quality. Doing business with America means more training and more skill development for Thai workers. It means better labor and environmental standards that promote growth. It means an engagement that is helping Thailand to escape the middle income trap and to improve the lives of regular people. And I particularly uh, want to pick up on Professor Titinan's reference uh, to a way in which we are planting the seeds for the future, investing in uh, the future of our relationship today, which is uh, the Young Southeast Asia Leaders Initiative, YSILI. Definitely not silly. Um, now I understand, is, am I right in thinking that there are some YSILI members in the audience today? Let me see. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Well, uh, I'm a fan. Um, good for you. I hope that uh, the numbers will expand and pretty soon uh, all the students will be raising their hands because not only is YSEALI a project that President Obama has personally invested a great deal of uh, priority to, but as somebody, Barack Obama, who himself was a young person in Southeast Asia uh, for a few years himself, he feels a very powerful connection. He's a believer uh, in this program. I've been with him uh, repeatedly in Southeast Asia when he's hosted town hall meetings uh, with YSEALI members uh, here in the region, including some Thai students who asked him questions, tough questions. Uh, and we've brought uh, YSEALI members to the United States as well, and we do so on a regular basis. It's one more way that we're engaging with young leaders and helping you to engage with each other and to engage across national borders within the 10 ASEAN countries uh, to help promote an ASEAN identity. With your help, uh, YSEALI is creating a cadre of young leaders here that work in partnership with each other 
and the United States to tackle the challenges that you have identified as important, uh, things that matter to you and that you see as challenges, economic development, environmental protection, education, civic engagement. I've been impressed and I know that President Obama has been tremendously impressed by the quality of the people, of you, of YCLE members. Uh, and it's great to be able to interact with you and I strongly support what you're doing. Now more broadly, uh, beyond the students, beyond YCLE, I know this is a, a thoughtful group and uh, you follow uh, the news and you're interested in uh, bilateral relations. So while I've spoken at some length about what defines our partnership, both historically and prospectively, looking forward, uh, I also need to say something about the political developments here in Thailand and the impact uh, that has on uh, U.S.-Thai relations over the course of the past year. The fact is, and it's unfortunate, but our relationship with Thailand has been challenged by the military coup that removed a democratically elected government uh, eight months ago. This morning, I had a chance to sit down and hold discussions uh, with uh, first former Prime Minister Yingluk, uh, then with former Prime Minister Abbasid, and then with uh, the interim Deputy Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, uh, Tanasak. And in each case, uh, I've discussed the current political situation in Thailand with each of them. And all sides have spoken about the importance of reconciliation and uh, their commitment to work to achieve Thailand's democratic future. Now, I understand this is an extremely sensitive issue. And I bring it up with all humility and great respect for the Kingdom of Thailand and for the Thai people. The United States does not take sides in Thai politics. We believe it is for the Thai people to determine the legitimacy of the, their political and their legal processes. But we are concerned about the significant restraints on freedoms since the coup, including the restrictions on speech and on assembly. And I've been very straightforward about these concerns. We're also particularly concerned that the political process doesn't seem to represent all elements of Thai society. Now, I want to repeat, we're not attempting to dictate the political path that Thailand should follow to get back to democracy or take sides in Thai politics. But an inclusive process promotes political reconciliation, which in turn is key to long-term stability. That's where our interests lie. The alternative, a narrow, restricted, process carries the risk of leaving many Thai citizens feeling that they've been excluded from the political process. That's the reason why we continue to advocate for a broader and more inclusive political process that allows all sectors of society to feel <coughs> represented, to feel that their voices are being heard. I'd add that the perception of fairness is also extremely important. And although this is being pretty blunt, when an elected leader is removed from office, is deposed, is then impeached by the authorities, the same authorities that conducted the coup, and then when a political leader is targeted with criminal charges at a time when the basic democratic processes and institutions in the country are interrupted, the international community is gonna be left with the impression that these steps could in fact be politically driven. 
And that's the reason why we hope to see a process that reinforces the confidence of the Thai people in their government and their judicial institutions and builds confidence internationally that Thailand is moving toward stable and participatory democracy. Ending martial law throughout the country and removing restrictions of speech and assembly, these would be important steps as part of a genuinely inclusive reform process that reflects the broad diversity of views within the country. And we hope that the results of that process will be stable democratic institutions that reflect and respond to the will of the Thai people. So the message that I'm bringing uh, to all of the people that I'm meeting with today and to you, to the Thai nation is the same. For the United States, Thailand is a valued friend and an important ally. Thailand is a country with whom we've got a long-standing history of broad cooperation on the range of issues that I've outlined, issues that are important uh, not just to our two countries, but to the region uh, and to the globe. We care deeply about this relationship. We care deeply about our uh, friendship with all the Thai people. And we care deeply about Thailand's prospects for success. And we wish you well. Let me stop there. And uh, with <coughs> Professor Tidinan, let me uh, try to respond to uh, some of your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, I think you've touched on the, the gamut of issues, uh, regional U.S. engagement with uh, Asia-Pacific, uh, ASEAN, and the bilateral alliance, the bilateral uh, treaty, uh, and then also the domestic situation here. So the, the floor is open. I know that the flavor of the day for this event is uh, young people. So I'm afraid that if you're not young, you're not going to get to ask the first question. Um, if you're young, uh, we have uh, simultaneous tra translation, so there's also mi hu fang. Ne? If you need it, uh, if you don't need it, it's fine. If you ask in Thai, I, I will translate for you if you need to. Otherwise, uh, you get extra credit if you do English. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Assistant Sec Secretary. I am Vasit Bantong from Thammasat University. And my question is, in your opinion, what are the skills needed in the 21st century for young people? Because in our generation, I believe that we are going to face several challenges, including climate changes and cyber terrorism and this kind of thing. Thank you. OK. Any other question or comment about the skills, how to prepare for a 21st century career? Um, well, thank you. Um, what I tell uh, young uh, students and officers who join uh, the State Department and join the Foreign Service is that uh, the number one most important attribute, the most important thing to have uh, to succeed is passion. Uh, now, you could argue that that's not a skill. But uh, what distinguishes uh, people who are truly successful, I believe, is that uh, they are doing something that they believe in, something that's important, and something that they love. It is certainly my experience that uh, people who have a passion uh, get good at what they're doing and people who are good at what they're doing have a lot of fun. Now, more specifically, uh, I think that in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, which is increasingly well wired electronically, uh, thanks to the IT uh, revolution, uh, it goes without saying that the ability to master uh, social media and high-tech platforms is essential. 
Uh, language skills are a major asset. Uh, and of course, uh, English is uh, very much the language of commerce and uh, diplomacy. We, the United States, have strongly supported uh, English language uh, training programs uh, throughout uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I think it gives uh, students, young people in this region, a uh, competitive advantage to be functional in uh, English. I also believe that um, gaining a perspective on one's own country and own society uh, comes most easily when you leave it. Uh, it was true for me, it's true for many people that you don't necessarily understand or appreciate uh, your own country and your own culture until you have seen it from a distance. And while I recognize that it's, it can be expensive uh, and it's uh, not always easy, uh, even if you're not going far, uh, I, th I see great value in uh, having some experience living uh, in another culture and uh, seeing your own society through someone else's eyes. Well, first of all, there's a, there's a wonderful and famous saying uh, 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 attributed to uh, Winston Churchill that uh, goes something like, um, democracy is the worst system of government except for all the others. Um, boiled down to its uh, essence, although there are many forms of government and there will always be debates about uh, the extent to which uh, elections mean democracy. You can't go anywhere on earth and show me a citizen of a country who says, my voice doesn't matter. I don't care about the future of my family, my town, or my county, or my country. Everyone, every citizen has a voice and those voices should be heard. Now, there has to be compromise uh, and there has to be uh, order and law. But democracy and the rule of law go hand in hand. Power corrupts. And the great strength in my view of democracy is that it forces societies or allows societies to build institutions. Institutions that will regulate the behavior of uh, citizens according to compromise, not according to absolute principles. Abraham Lincoln was famous uh, for saying in the heat of the Civil War uh, that we should dedicate ourselves to government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Democracy is imperfect, but it gives a voice to all of its citizens. It builds institutions that defend the weak, uh, and it has a resilience and a self-correcting mechanism to it that allows the voters to decide that they've had enough uh, to make their views known and to take a different tack uh, when uh, there is a consensus among the majority.
that would be my answer. Thank you. Um, last week, uh, you held um, a dialogue. Please, please tell us your name. And oh, sorry, my name is Na Pham, and I work for the BBC. Um, last week at the dialogue in Manila, um, you um, and the Filipino um, counterparts said a lot about South China Sea. And after that, the Chinese spokeswoman said that the third party countries should not get involved and um, should not in instigate um, tension in the sea. Uh, what, what is your reply to that? Well, I have uh, regular uh, and very constructive uh, dialogues with my uh, Chinese counterparts, uh, as does, of course, Secretary Kerry, and as does President Obama. And we have been uh, clear and consistent uh, in uh, conveying to the Chinese uh, the area where we are neutral and the areas where we take a position with regard to territorial disputes in the South China Sea. The United States, one country's side against another when it comes to the matter of how the dispute over sovereignty will ultimately be resolved. We fully agree that that is an issue that should be resolved among the claimants themselves, but we believe strongly that it should be resolved peacefully and through diplomatic means. Where we do take positions, however, is on matters of international law and on international rights, such as freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight, the right to unimpeded uh, commerce. We oppose unilateral actions that aim to advance a claim by changing the status quo or uh, coercing or threatening another country or claimant. That's a principle that the United States will always support and I believe that uh, Thailand and other countries in the region uh, support and value that same principle. So our encouragement of the parties to exercise self-restraint, to apply the golden rule of not doing things to each other that they don't want done to them our advocacy of the principle that universal principles and law apply equally to big countries and to small, and our push for constructive, uh, peaceful management of disputes is by no means interference. That is part of our contribution to the stability and the security of the Asia-Pacific region that, among other things, has been instrumental in China's extraordinary growth. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Buntida. I'm a fourth-year student from the Faculty of, of Political Science, Chulalongkorn University, uh, measuring in international relations. Um, in our study, we have been reading a lot about um, the retreat of democracy and the upsurge of um, the authoritarian rule. So in, in our region here, it is a mix between the two. Like we have more or less democracy or even none at all. So I would like to ask your opinion about the outlook of the democratization in Southeast Asia with the special reference to Thailand and Myanmar. A privilege because I was alumni of Jula too. Uh, my question is about Thailand. You have been talking about the uh, the unnecessity of martial law, you have been talking about compromise and rule of law, and I guess that you also talked to foreign minister this morning too. So I would like to uh, hear how he responded to these issues. And uh, how do you measure so far that, you know, on which from left to right, uh, where we are standing now? Thank you. 
I will uh, leave it for the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Interim Foreign Minister, to uh, speak for himself. It's a well-established diplomatic uh, principle that uh, one does not either uh, disclose details of a diplomatic conversation, but certainly one doesn't speak for the other side. I have no hesitation, though, in uh, telling you that I think that I got a serious hearing. Uh, I came to Thailand on behalf of my government both to listen, listen to the government, listen to the political leaders, listen to civil society and listen to you, but also to convey our views and our hopes for uh, Thailand. And I said to the foreign minister, as I have uh, said to the political leaders and to uh, you today in this speech, that the United States has a huge interest in Thailand's success. A strong, economically thriving, influential, politically stable Thailand is an essential element of a thriving and growing uh, region. We believe that the curtailment of civil rights, uh, the restrictions on universal rights such as freedom of speech and freedom of assembly don't in the long run contribute to stability. We believe that taking steps uh, soon to end martial law, to allow for legitimate uh, and peaceful voicing of views, and to promote an inclusive process in which all sectors of society feel that they have, that, that they have had a hearing, will generate institutions and outcomes in which all members of society, all sectors of society believe they have a stake. And it's important for all citizens to have a stake in the political process and for them to have respect uh, and trust in the political and the judicial institutions. Now, that brings me to the broader question. There is no on and off switch uh, that takes you to democracy uh, in one step. Democracy is about allowing the citizens actively to participate in shaping the decisions and the future of their own country. Uh, it's a tough job and all of us are constantly seeking to refine and improve our systems. No system is perfect, certainly not the system we have in the United States. But the push for democracy, the push for justice, the push for accountability, the push for equality doesn't come out of a textbook. It comes out of people's hearts. It comes out of people's belief and conviction that they can create a better life and a better system uh, for their families and for their children. I believe that the push for justice and for democracy is inexorable, that it is unstoppable. There are obstacles, there are setbacks, but that fundamental quest for opportunity uh, and that fundamental sense of uh, justice is universal, not an American value, uh, not an Asian value. Now, in the case of Myanmar, after 40 plus years of authoritarian rule, we have seen uh, an extraordinary 
uh, process of economic and, politically, and political reform. It's been dramatic, uh, and it is, it's been difficult. There are still very significant challenges uh, ahead. But I don't believe that the citizens of Myanmar who have experienced uh, access to uh, communications, who have found new opportunities, who've been able to voice and make common cause with like-minded uh, neighbors and friends, I don't think they are willing to go backwards. I don't think that they want to uh, retreat. And it is both an opportunity and a responsibility for the international community, for Myanmar's neighbors, uh, and for partners like the United States to help them to succeed. I believe that General Tanasak has briefed you on measures taken uh, by the government to fight human trafficking. So I'd like to know if you could assess these measures and hear your recommendations as well. Thank you. Okay, human trafficking. Thai U.S., anything else uh, around here? I'm, I'm we, uh, pressed for time, so I'm going to call on the Gui to concisely um, ask his question. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel Sama, for your very, very good uh, So Kunkawi is with uh, ISIS, so he's a senior fellow with us. I have two questions. Can you tell me, apart from the Kobogo, what are the new activity you plan for Thai and US? Secondly, when the new ambassador is coming to Bangkok. Thank you. Okay, human trafficking, Cobra Gold, and new ambassador. I'll take the one last one. To, um, um, Mr. McLeod, George McLeod of the FCCT. About this time last year, your ambassador in Myanmar said that there was a target to uh, delist at least one person from the sanctions list in Myanmar. Uh, one year on, there's been no progress along that. Is that an administrative issue, or does it reflect uh, a change in, uh, in, in policy towards, the, towards Myanmar due to the violence in Rakhine State? Thank you. Well, um I'm here, as I said, to uh, listen and to communicate. The United States uses our embassy uh, to do the same thing uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. That uh, diplomatic engagement is critically important for us, uh, particularly in an important country uh, like Thailand. Now, we're blessed to have a very distinguished uh, charge d'affaires, Patrick Murphy, and a really first-class uh, embassy team. Trust me that there are a lot to be posted to Bangkok. Uh, it's also not unusual to have a gap of uh, between the departure of uh, the U.S. ambassador and the arrival of the arrival of his or her um, successor. We are working, and uh, know that the White House, uh, when they can, will announce uh, the appointment of a new ambassador to. Uh, the Kingdom of Thailand in order to uh, continue our, our work. On that regard, with respect to trafficking in persons, uh, this is one of the many areas, including law enforcement, counterterrorism, uh, global health, uh, trade and investment, and so on, where important work uh, continues uh, at uh, the working level, at technical levels, uh, because this is very much in uh, the best interests of both countries and essential to the region. The, the scourge, uh, the tragedy of human trafficking is one that cannot be ignored. Uh, we are uh, mindful of and appreciative of the commitments uh, and the pledges made by the uh, interim government with respect to uh, trafficking, uh, that includes the sexual trafficking of women, it includes uh, trafficking of labor in uh, industry, etc. Um, what we are seeking to do is to, in partnership, generate more measurable progress and real results. Uh, this is a topic of ongoing conversation uh, between us and an area where uh, we think uh, it's important to uh, make, 
achieve further progress. Uh, Cobra Gold is a regional multinational exercise uh, involving not only the U.S. and Thailand, but many of our important neighbors, including now India, uh, including China. And uh, it is uh, this year uh, recalibrated uh, and uh, scaled appropriately in the wake of the uh, political events here. But it is uh, proceeding, and it is focused on humanitarian assistance and uh, disaster relief, which are top priorities uh, for all of us. I don't have anything uh, further to announce uh, uh, in terms of uh, U.S. Thailand uh, events uh, or programs. And lastly, on the issue of uh, U.S. sanctions in uh, Myanmar, uh, whether it is in Myanmar or uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, the sanctions and including the uh, SDN, the Special Designated National List that identifies uh, individuals who stand in violation of uh, important laws. We add people when the information presents itself and we remove people from the list when we are able to uh, document uh, behavior that uh, warrants it. Uh, we believe that showing how to get off the list, what kind of behavior uh, constitutes a path to redemption, uh, is a very powerful and positive uh, device in uh, encouraging uh, reform in Myanmar as well as elsewhere. And so to the principle of delisting, uh, it's a matter of uh, making an assessment and having the appropriate authorities concur with that judgment. Okay, thank you. I think it would be fitting, only fitting, if we would just take the last comment or question from around here in this section somewhere. Um, Patria and then, um, which university are you with? Very good, very good. You have the last question. Okay, um, good afternoon, Mr. Russell. Uh, I am Patria from Jalalongkorn University. I'm studying in a fourth year student, political science. So um, over the last few years, we have been hearing about the U.S. engagement in Asia. But recently, with much going on around the world and the U.S. involvement in, for example, in Ukraine and in the Middle East, so is the U.S. still committed to its pivot to Asia and rebalance policies. Um, is it still on? Can you convince us? <laughs> Please, you have the last question or comment. Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Karen Van Amstrad, from University. Um, I've actually been studying in the United States for my undergraduate degree. One of the things I experienced is that people with disabilities actually get more chances in ed education and as well as equality. So um, there's not much here. So do you think, is it possible for the United States to actually have engagement on that? Because as you say in your speech, there's actually a lot of things you do to actually improve the lives of people. But you have never mentioned about people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great question. Let, let me start there. First of all, um, sharing our experiences and encouraging progress on uh, civic programs, for example, to uh, assist and to fight discrimination against people with disabilities, uh, or for that matter, uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual preference, uh, or for that matter, on the basis of gender, uh, is a top priority for the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok as it is elsewhere. And the State Department is active as is the White House. We have a special envoy on uh, disabilities. We have a uh, special envoy on women's empowerment. And uh, these are programs that are integrated in our uh, diplomatic efforts. I, I don't want to sound just like a cheerleader for uh, democracy, but the fact of the matter is that 
the reason that the US government spends time, energy, and money in promoting these programs, in raising awareness, in sharing our know-how and expertise, and in encouraging the development of good programs worldwide is because it's important to our citizens. This has been a grassroots movement. And it's, an, it's a place where government has been responsive to what people want and what people care about. And as I said earlier, what people want is a fair chance. People want an opportunity. People want respect. People want uh, justice. And according opportunities and justice uh, to people that are different than us, people with disabilities, uh, people of, uh, from ethnic minorities, uh, women or LGBT uh, folks, um, is uh, uh, not only worthwhile, but an important uh, objective. More broadly, with regard to the uh, engagement in uh, the Asia Pacific by the United States, against the backdrop of tremendous uh, challenges and crises, uh, not only in the Middle East, where they are pretty formidable, but also in uh, Africa, for example, which is uh, facing terrible threats from uh, Boko Haram and uh, fundamentalist groups on the one hand, and inf infectious disease like Ebola uh, on the other. Uh, the, the pursuit of uh, our interests as the United States forces us to deal with these crises. We have no choice. That's why Secretary Kerry has just gone to the Middle East and gone to uh, Africa. That's why President Obama is on his way uh, soon to Saudi Arabia. But what keeps us engaged in Asia, and I think that the simplest and clearest answer to whether you can believe in our continued engagement is the fact that it is in America's national interest. The East Asia region is uh, the most dynamic uh, economically uh, thriving part of the world. We want to be part of it. We are part of it. Uh, the demographics, the, the youth uh, figures, and the growth of the middle class in Southeast Asia is extraordinary. We want to get to know you. We want to work with you. We want to study with you. We want to trade with you. This is essential to our economic security as well as our, uh, our own broader security interests. So it's not because America is generous. It's not as a uh, passing fancy. Uh, it's not because we're afraid of China. It's because America is a Pacific nation whose economic and security interests are so closely tied with your future and your decisions that we need to be part of your life. And I will say that if you look at the number of times that President Obama has visited Asia, that Vice President Biden has visited Asia, that Secretary Kerry has visited Asia, uh, you will see the evidence of how high a priority the U.S. government places on our relationships throughout this region. Thank you. Okay, let me bring this to a close. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary has to uh, be at another meeting. I just want to say that uh, we want to thank you for being here, for your clarity of remarks. Uh, you know, I don't think that we are surprised by many of the things that, you, that you've said. But it is important for someone of your intellect and stature and experience and position to still come here and say it. 
Uh, I know that we've hosted uh, your predecessors here. Only that uh, there were some big shoes to fill. And I think you've more than done it. Uh, so, so thank you very much. I also want to thank the, the audience for joining, and in particular the students from all the universities. Thank you very much.